B cell depleters like rituximab, ocrevus, Briumbi, Kasimta have become very popular treatments of MS, but are we giving the optimal dose? According to this analysis of research done on ocrevus, the answer may be no. Even though low doses are very good at stopping new MRI lesions and relapses, perhaps a higher dose is needed to optimally minimize the probability of disability progression. I'll analyze this article in detail, and I'll really stick my neck out there and give my own personal opinion. And I think these marginal improvements, these optimizations of the way to use existing drugs is very important because remember what coach Tony D'Amato said, we can climb out of hell one inch at a time. The data in this article are from OPERA trials, two randomized trials, OPERA 1 and OPERA 2, comparing Ocrevus versus Rebif in relapsing multiple sclerosis. Interestingly, I was a fellow when these trials were going on, and I was actually an EDSS so I actually contributed some of this data indirectly. This is an older study looking at different subgroups in people in the trial and looking at people with a body mass index under 25 and over 25. And this chart is looking at the relative risk of disability progression. And you can see this line represents one, no difference compared to Rebif. And you can see that people who had a higher BMI had a slight trend towards less disability progression, but it overlapped with one. It wasn't even statistically significant. But for people with a smaller body mass index, the difference was much greater. You can see the data are pushed way to the left, representing a very significant reduction in disability progression. And the idea is larger people with a higher BMI are essentially getting less of the drug because they have more body mass. Now, this isn't a great way to do the research because there could be something else about people who are over weight or obese. Maybe they're less healthy in other ways. Maybe the drug is less effective for them for other reasons. So what I'm going to show you is essentially an updated study with a better methodology looking at actual levels of the drug. And so again, this is a post hoc analysis of data from OPERA 1 and OPERA 2. And they also looked at the oratorio trial, which is Ocrevus versus placebo in primary progressive multiple sclerosis. Here is the publication. And they divided Ocrevus blood levels into quartiles. First quartiles, those with the lowest drug levels. Second quartile, third quartile, and fourth quartile, those with the highest blood levels. And they looked for correlations with different things. The most important thing, of course, is confirmed disability progression. Now, there's a lot of fluctuation in measures of disability. There's a little day-to-day -day variation. And so CDP, confirmed disability progression, means a patient has a a certain level of disability, they come to a follow-up and they're a little bit worse, then they come to another follow-up and they're still worse. And this suggests that it's true progression of disability. They actually got worse. It's not just day-to-day -day variation. They also looked at annualized relapse rate, ARR, relapses per person per year, and they also looked at MRI lesions. If you want more information on Ocrevus, you could click a link in the description below. But as a brief overview, Ocrevus is a B cell depleting drug. This is a B lymphocyte, the cells that make antibodies. It has a protein, CD20, on the surface, which Ocrevus binds to, causing the cells to break open and die, essentially depleting almost all B lymphocytes sites. This is very similar to the drugs rituximab, Briumbi, and Kasimta. And the typical dose is 300 milligrams IV twice, two weeks apart, and after that, 600 milligrams once every six months. But is this dose too low? It's approved for both relapsing forms of MS based on the OPERA 1 and 2 trials and primary progressive MS based on data from the Oratorios trial. The half-life of the drug is 26 days, but the biological effect is much, much longer because it takes the bone marrow a long time to replete B lymphocytes. And in some people who have taken the drug for years, it can take much longer than six months. These are some of the data from the original clinical trials. First, we'll look at the OPERA studies. This is Ocrevus versus Rebif in relapsing MS. We're looking at active or gadolinium enhancing lesions. And you can see there was a dramatic reduction, a 94.4% reduction. So with Ocrevus, only 0.02 lesions per person. In other words, only one in 50 people essentially having a lesion versus 0.29 with Rebif in the OPERA 1 study. Similar data for the OPERA 2 study. A very 
very dramatic reduction. So even at standard doses of Ocrevus, it's very good at stopping active lesions. You can imagine some people may have anti-drug antibodies and those people may still get enhancing lesions. This is data from the same study on disability progression. Again, Ocrevus versus Rebif. You can see Rebif or interferon beta 1A, the dotted purple line, 15.2% had disability progression versus only 9.8% having disability progression with Ocrevus. This is a 35.6% reduced risk of disability progression. This is data in primary progressive MS, placebo in the top line versus Ocrevus in the blue line. And there's a more modest difference, but there was a statistically significant 24% reduced risk of disability progression with Ocrevus. So now we'll move back to our post hoc analysis, and this is how they divided the quartiles of Ocrevus blood levels in relapsing MS. For instance, they drew blood at weeks 1, 24, 48, and 72, 30 minutes after the infusion at week 72 and at day 84 and 96, and they took the average concentration over the treatment period. So this isn't one level of Ocrevus, it's sort of an average level. And they divided them into quartiles. So the first quartile was less than 15.4 micrograms per milliliter, second quartile 15.4 to 18.7, third quartile 18.7 to 22.2, and fourth quartile greater than 22.2. So we're looking at relatively modest differences. We could be comparing someone in the first quartile with a level of 15 micrograms per milliliter to someone in the fourth quartile with a level of around 25, for instance. They did the same thing for progressive multiple sclerosis, and as you can see, the numbers are very, very similar. And obviously, if Ocrevus level makes a difference, it's not going to be through magic. It's going to be due to its effect on the B lymphocytes. And as you can see in these charts, there is in fact a correlation between quintiles of Ocrevus levels and B cell counts. They looked at the proportion of individuals who have depleted B cells. In other words, who who have B cells less than five per microliter, which is a very low level. And you can see people in the fourth quintile, the solid line, almost all of them have depleted B cells. But if you look at the first quartile, it's actually a pretty significant amount have some detectable B cells. So some people seem to be a little bit resistant to this drug for whatever reason. And now we move to the results and I'm gonna show you a bunch of data that looks like this. And what you're looking at are the four quartiles of Ocrevus levels. So Ocrevus 1, people with the first quartile of Ocrevus levels, the lowest levels, second quartile, third quartile, and fourth quartile, those with the highest levels. And compared to either interferon or placebo, we're looking at relapses in OPER1 and OPER2 trials. So it's compared to interferon beta or Rebif. And here you see the rate ratio. In other words, the ratio of people getting a high level of Ocrevus in the third or fourth quartile versus a low level in the first or second quartile, and here you can see the relative risk and the p-value. So let's look at the annualized relapse rate, relapses per person per year. In the first quartile, you can see it was 0.14, or about one relapse per seven years, a very low level. Second quartile was 0.18, then 0.13, and in the fourth quartile, 0.17. Essentially, all of these numbers are the same, and obviously it was not statistically significant. So does giving more Ocrevus prevent relapses? The answer is no. It makes no difference. You have a low rate of relapses regardless of the dose of Ocrevus, regardless of the level of Ocrevus you're exposed to. But what about new T2 lesions or enlarging T2 lesions in relapsing MS? Again, we can see the rate of new lesions in the first quartile. It was 0.14 second quartile 0.03, third quartile 0.03, fourth quartile 0.04. So it was definitely a lot more in people getting the lowest level of Ocrevus. And you can see the rate ratio was 0.46. In other words, those getting the higher quartiles, the third and fourth quartile of Ocrevus, having 54% fewer lesions. And this was statistically significant, p-value of 0.01. So it does seem to make a small difference, but these are all tiny, tiny numbers. Even 0.14 is one new lesion per every seven people over the course of the study. That's a very small number. I'm not sure it's clinically significant. If we look at relapsing MS, the numbers are ridiculously low. 
0.03, one relapse per 33 people, 0.01, 0.02, 0.02. It makes no difference. Any level of exposure to Ocrevus is highly effective at suppressing gadolinium-enhancing lesions. If you look at enhancing lesions in primary progressive MS, it's even more pointless because no one getting any amount of Ocrevus had any enhancing lesions, zero, 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 zero. You can see some people getting placebo did have active lesions, but again, the dose makes no difference, the dose of Ocrevus, that is. And if you look at new or enlarging T2 lesions, again, the numbers are all similar and very low, 0 0.03, 0 0.03, 0 0.02, 0 0.04, all ridiculously low, but much, much better than placebo, 3.75. So any amount of Ocrevus is much more effective than placebo at suppressing new lesions, but the exact amount of exposure doesn't seem to make a difference, at least in terms of newer enlarging T2 lesions. But of course, the whole point of this research is, hey, maybe any amount of Ocrevus is effective at preventing new lesions, gadolinium-enhancing lesions, or relapses, but what about that smoldering inflammation, that low-level inflammation within lesions? Maybe if we give a higher dose of Ocrevus, it affects subtle disability progression, even if the effect on relapses is the same. So this is the data in relapsing remitting MS on 24-week confirmed disability progression, looking at interferon beta 1a, Rebif, versus the four quartiles of Ocrevus, 1, 2, 3, and 4. So you can see those getting Rebif did the worst. They had the highest rate of disability progression, the line on the top, which makes sense because Rebif is less effective than Ocrevus overall. In terms of the quartiles, there does seem to be a trend here. You can see the darkest line, the fourth quartile, they had the lowest rate of disability progression. The third quartile did the second best. The first and second quartiles are reversed with those in the second quartile doing a little bit worse than those in the first quartile, but there's seems to be a trend here with those getting higher levels of the drug doing a little bit better on average. Though I note the absolute differences are quite small, perhaps 5% or so, so you'd have to give 20 people or so a higher dose of Ocrevus just to prevent one person from having disability progression, and it would have to be worth potential additional side effects, but there does seem to be something going on here. With primary progressive MS, perhaps the data are a little bit less impressive. You can see the lines almost on top of each other, and in fact, the third quartile of Ocrevus doing the worst, but the fourth quartile did the best, and you can see there's an overall trend here. They looked at high versus low exposure, in other words, third and fourth quartile versus first and second quartile. And you can see there was a hazard ratio of 0.76. In other words, a 24% reduction in disability progression in those getting the higher levels of Ocrevus, though it was not statistically significant, P value equal 0 0.099, but maybe there's some weak trend here. They also looked at brain atrophy or shrinkage of the brains of the participants. We know MS can be associated with accelerated brain atrophy, which is associated with a worse prognosis, and they looked at the mean percentage loss in brain volume, and you can see the first quartile of Ocrevus exposure was minus 0.54%, or losing about a half a percent of total brain volume over the course of the study, second quartile minus 0.61%, minus 0.61, and the fourth quartile, minus 0.66. So those getting more Ocrevus doing slightly worse, actually, on average, but not a statistically significant difference. They also looked at progressive MS, and again, there is simply no difference, minus 0.85, minus 0.95, minus 1.03, and minus 0.77. The numbers are roughly the same, no statistically significant difference. So does giving more Ocrevus or being exposed to higher levels of Ocritus reduce brain atrophy? Apparently the answer is no. As I mentioned earlier, you'd have to balance the benefits of a higher dose versus possible side effects, but this is fairly reassuring and there doesn't seem to be a higher risk with those exposed to higher levels of the drug. So for instance, Ocrevus level was not associated with infections, serious infections, or even infusion reactions. So the smaller individuals getting more of the drug or having higher blood levels didn't seem to get more infections. So it 
may at least be safe to give higher doses. And because it seems to be safe to be exposed to higher levels of ocrevus, and there's preliminary data that it may reduce disability progression, this has actually inspired randomized trials. So in these two studies, people are gonna be randomized to standard dose of ocrevus, in other words, 600 milligrams every six months, to a higher dose of ocrevus and see if it's actually better. The study in relapsing MS is the Mousset trial, and the study in primary progressive MS is the Gavote trial. And they're gonna give people either the standard dose, 600 milligrams, or 1,200 milligrams, double the dose if you weigh less than 75 kilograms, or 1,800 milligrams, triple the dose if you weigh more than 75 kilograms every 24 weeks or roughly six months, again, compared to the standard dose. If you're interested in entering these studies, I'll include the clinicaltrials.gov links in the comments below. And as promised, I'll end the video with my personal opinion. Unfortunately, I'm not optimistic about this one, and I don't think it's gonna work. I'm just very, very skeptical. The reason for that is what I'm showing you is not a randomized trial. It's potentially very confounded data because people who have lower levels of ocrevus in their body may have lower levels for a reason, such as having a higher body mass index or even having anti-drug antibodies, and having a higher BMI may be associated with a worse prognosis of multiple sclerosis overall, and there's some other data that suggests that to be the case. It's not the same as randomizing someone to a higher dose versus a lower dose. And I'm just skeptical of the idea that someone with depleted B cells could benefit from getting more of the drug. And in fact, there's always the opportunity for personalized medicine where we can check B cell counts and potentially give people more of the drug if they have non-B cell depletion. But do we really want to give additional B cell depletion to someone who has a B cell count of zero? And we can test this through flow cytometry, the anti-CD19 and CD20 count very, very easily, and I do this all the time. The other thing to take into account is these are very small differences. We're talking about maybe at best a 5% absolute difference in disability progression, and so we're gonna have to give a lot of people the drug just maybe to prevent one person from progressing, which of course may be worth it if it's safe and it is a real effect, which remains to be seen. The other problem, in my opinion, is that I don't necessarily think giving chronic B cell depletion forever is a good idea in general. I'm an early adopter of rituximab. I've used it for a long time. People at University of California, San Francisco have used it for a long time and in Sweden and other areas. And the problem is if you give a high dose every six months forever, like a thousand milligrams of rituximab every six months, the risk in the short run isn't that high with most people not getting serious infections. But many people can develop low immunoglobins over time the reason for that is the B cells turn into plasma cells, which do not have CD20 and are hence resistant to these drugs, but your plasma cells don't last forever, and plasma cells also make antibodies, so if you keep knocking out your B cells and you don't regenerate your plasma cells, eventually your antibodies will be low, and if you have low immunoglobin G in particular, that's definitively linked to a higher rate of infections, and I've seen a lot of young people uh, who are healthy otherwise get bad infections infections from these drugs such as COVID, urosepsis, pneumonia, etc. It's definitely no joke. So I actually use the strategy often of using less rituximab, for instance, 500 milligrams every year in people who are stable for a period just to avoid continuous B cell depletion. I think it can be quite risky in the long run. That being said, I do think there's enough evidence to do these trials, seeing that it appears to be relatively safe and there's some preliminary data it could make a difference. I don't think it's unethical for them to do these trials, and I'm very prepared to eat my words if I'm wrong. We'll see what happens, and if you're interested, I would encourage you to even enter the trial and contribute to this scientific research. I'd be interested to know what you think. Do you think this is promising data? Do you think I'm completely wrong and a higher dose makes sense? Are we underdosing drugs such as Casimta that had a dose finding trial and they used the lowest dose necessary to suppress gadolinium enhancing lesions. So Casimta should be less effective than Ocrevus if this whole theory is true. But again, it remains to be seen. And let me know if you have suggestions for future videos.